Friends, a love story tells the story of Angela Bassett and Courtney B. Vance. The book is a combination of sorts that tells the stories of their individual personal and professional lives, followed by how they came together and the resulting marriage. Prior to the two becoming a couple, the chapters switch back and forth, with the subjects discussing a particular period in their lives. It follows a format of um, Bassett's childhood, then Vance's childhood, Bassett's undergrad years, Vance's undergrad years, etc. Once they become a couple, both perspectives around an event are discussed within the same chapter. Angela Bassett was born in Harlem, New York, but she spent most of her childhood in St. Petersburg, Florida. While still in Harlem, her father did odd jobs around the neighborhood, while her mom had a stable job as a nurse's aide. Bassett expressed that her parents had her and her sister relatively close together, but without any real plan for how they would support and raise them. I'm not one for telling people what to do with their lives, but I do think family planning and the associated conversations are important to have before actually having kids, and actually before even getting married. Uh, Bassett's parents sent her to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, to live with an aunt and uncle when she was a toddler, so shortly after her sister was born. I think her sister's like maybe 10 months or something like that younger than her, but not much of an age gap. Her parents were facing the difficulty of trying to raise two very small children while also both having to work. It's sad that Bassett wouldn't see her father again for several years, and he didn't seem to even call to speak with her on the phone. Fortunately, Bassett's aunt and uncle were good people. It's important to note that despite the hardships that black people faced at the time, uh, this couple seemed to be doing relatively well. The husband was a self-employed entrepreneur, and the wife had a stable, skilled job as a teacher. I think it's incredibly generous and the right thing to do to help family members who are in need, but I've read multiple instances of people having kids that they can't afford or other things are going on in their lives, so family has to step in to take care of the kids. And then when the kids settle into stability, the parents come back suddenly to get them. A gradual transition might actually be a better idea, especially if the kids don't remember or don't maintain a close relationship with their parents. I'm not particularly into kids, but I do find their adventures and escapades to be amusing. I enjoyed hearing stories from Bassett's childhood, as well as Vance's. They were entertaining, but usually sweet and innocent stories. When Angela went back to her mom, they moved with her younger sister to St. Petersburg, Florida, where either her mom was originally from or had a lot of family. Um, at this point in life, her mom was working a series of well, low-paying jobs, trying to move up in salary to be able to better provide for herself and her kids. I think Angela's mother's desire that her children have a different and better life than hers played a crucial role in Angela's development. She also raised her daughters to take pride in themselves and their appearance, regardless of how little they might have had. Unfortunately, during her, I guess you would consider them tween years, like maybe around the age of like 9 to 11, something like that, uh, Angela was molested by two of her mother's boyfriends. Her mother did the right thing, which was believing Bassett, and unless she had prior knowledge of their habits, which it doesn't seem she did, it certainly wasn't her fault. But I can't help but wondering how was she meeting these men? Were they targeting her because she had two young daughters at home, was struggling financially, and their, their father wasn't around? I mean, it, it's not really clarified, but those were questions that I had. Um, I took issue with the manner in which Bassett's mom resolved these situations. Like, it was great that she believed her, but like with the first boyfriend, I didn't see the point of arranging a confrontation with him. It might have been a way of giving Angela voice in the situation, but it doesn't seem to be something that she was interested in. It seemed to be unnecessarily dramatic and likely uncomfortable for Angela. And with the second boyfriend, she also did the right thing by ending the relationship, but I don't understand remaining friends with the man. By remaining friends with this person, your daughter has to continue having contact with someone who took advantage of her. Or even if you don't bring them around, she has to know that you're maintaining contact with the man who violated her. Um, while discussing her childhood, Angela Bassett mentions not being scarred by her childhood molestation. But then later in the book, she discusses her problems with men and her discomfort with her sexuality. It's not my place to speak on her behalf or to say how someone should feel in such a situation, but I believe the two are connected. She glosses over, or at least downplays, this aspect of her childhood and the impact it had on her development. 
people deal with things in their own way, but she doesn't really hold the men accountable for their being inappropriate, but rather provides possible explanations, which are really excuses for what they did. Like there's no, there's no logical explanation to foot for why a grown man should be inappropriately touching a child. Uh, Angela's mom isn't perfect, and she certainly makes mistakes along the way, which is human, but she's pretty modern, or at least logical for her time. She seems like an interesting lady who would probably be a fun old woman to be around. The idea of not being average or not settling for being average that she instilled in her kids was incredibly important. She might not have delivered the message in the most dignified manner, but it was nonetheless poignant and life-changing. It was key to Bassett's development and later success that her mom had high expectations for her. Too often, being black and from certain neighborhoods result in people, parents included, having low expectations for kids and not pushing or encouraging them to strive for more. But exposing kids, especially those from underprivileged backgrounds, to different experiences can be life-changing. One such experience exposed Bassett to theater, and that one event arguably changed the direction of her life. Angela's family, well, her mom's family, seems to be a bunch of characters. Reading her account of conversations with her mom about the birds and the bees was hilarious. The whole scenario of a mom taking her to a drugstore and talking to her about condoms was pure comedy, like the language that she uses. Likewise, I was lectured as a child, but I don't think I've ever spoken to anyone about anything for eight hours, even as an adult. I could just imagine what it might have been like to sit in a car and get lectured while driving around for what's really a whole work shift. Likewise, the story of her grandmother becoming a Jehovah's Witness and telling her about the world coming to an end in a few years was really funny. Uh, Courtney B. Vance, on the other hand, had roots in Chicago, but was born and raised in Detroit. The city's dramatic change occurred during his childhood and motivated his parents to initially move to a different neighborhood and to then put Vance and his older sister in private, predominantly white schools. His parents wanted the Vance kids to live in an integrated community to learn how to be comfortable with navigating a white world. Someone who looms large in Courtney's life is his father, Conroy Vance. Courtney's father was originally from Chicago and had been raised in a foster home. Now, people have a hard enough time being adopted as babies before they can remember, so I can only imagine the trauma of your parents giving you away as a preschooler, like around the age of three or four, where you can remember them and are aware that for whatever reason they chose to give you up. Vance grew up with his father in the house, but they lacked the deep connection that he saw between his mother and older sister. His father would joke around and make fun of him, but was unable to have deep or important conversations. Vance, as a result, never spoke with his father, or his mother for that matter, about sex, while his sister did with their mom. His early contact with his dad's pornography magazine shaped his ideas of sex and sexuality. There are a lot of examples of toxic masculinity within his father's life, or what he shares about his father's life, and also within Vance's relationship with his father. He also internalized a lot of what he saw in his parents' relationship, where they argued, his mom let his dad have his way, and his dad in turn kept a lot of secrets. Courtney would go on to attend predominantly white schools from high school through grad school, and adapting to these new environments was difficult, and he wanted help from his father with figuring out his identity as a black male in predominantly white environments. But because they weren't that close, he didn't feel like he could have these kinds of conversations with his father. And so as he got older, he eventually began to sense that the schools he attended weren't interested in him as a person, but rather for his performance as an athlete. He felt, if not unwelcome, then unwanted. Vance's experiences attending predominantly white schools, but feeling as though he didn't belong, reminded me of the main character from A Particular Kind of Black Man, where both feel obligated to portray this image to the world that leaves them feeling empty and lost. Ironically, despite growing up in a two-parent household with his biological dad trying to give him a better life, he still shared the experience that his father had of feeling unwanted. Uh, it's worth noting that Vance grew up in a stable two-parent home, but it seemed to lack the intimacy of a family. Meanwhile, Bassett grew up in a poor one-parent home and experienced a lot of instability as a child, but she had a mom who relished in having 
relished in having difficult conversations that she actually tested. Uh, their respective families had things the others seemed to lack while they were growing up. I had no real prior knowledge of Angela Bassett as a person outside of the role she played, but I would never have imagined dating being hard for her. Like, I think she's incredibly pretty and like very smart, but I man, I don't know what people look for in women. It's pretty humanizing to learn that she had similar dating experiences to most other women. And Angela is obviously intelligent, but I also admire her principles along with her interest and pride in black culture and history. It often seems that when black people achieve success or to achieve success, they feel compelled to distance themselves from or downplay their blackness. So college can be a period of great adjustment and stress on its own, much less trying to also navigate the awkwardness of establishing a relationship with an absentee father. It was quite disappointing that Bassett's father turned out to be just as problematic when present as he was when absent. Angela explains her father's behavior as some men not knowing how to be fathers, which is true, but in the case of her father and other men like him, some men just aren't decent people. It's not even a matter of being a father and not knowing how to raise children, but just not knowing or caring to know how to conduct yourself or treat other people as human beings. I truly enjoyed reading about Bassett's experiences and growth as a woman. I haven't shared all of her experiences, but still appreciate her journey. So I didn't know that Angela Bassett and Charles S. Dutton, rock, right, dude from Baltimore, were in a relationship way back when. Their relationship was a hot, flaming mess. Entertaining to read from the outside, but nerve-wracking to actually experience. I appreciate Bassett's honesty and insight into women staying in dysfunctional relationships that they don't find fulfilling. And her relationship with Dutton and a night at the Tony Awards gave me secondhand embarrassment. The drama of dating between two actors seems fitting, but also incredibly draining. Having grown up seeing black people on television and in movies, it's easy to take for granted that this wasn't always the case. And having admired Bassett as an actress since childhood, it's amusing to read about her gushing over the actors and actresses that she'd admired since childhood. Some of my favorite parts of the book were getting behind the scenes info about what went into securing and portraying some of her most famous roles. It's inspiring to learn about the mental and physical discipline that went into preparing for these roles. It's it was interesting that Vance initially got into acting because he wanted to meet new people outside of athletics. And I actually really respect his grind of working incredibly hard around the clock in pursuit of his goals. Yet while his professional development was admirable, Vance didn't sound like such a great person during his young adult years. It's refreshing to read about him looking back on his life through the eyes of a well-adjusted older man cutting through the bravado and ego of youth to explain the insecurity and discomfort with emotions that guided his actions. And as an adult, Vance is probably a pretty decent guy, but I still found him insufferable at some points in the book. Personally, I don't like when professionals speak down on or criticize the performance of others in their industry. It just, like, it just rubs me the wrong way. It feels kind of catty, right? One of the byproducts of toxic masculinity is men feeling like they have to hide or aren't allowed to have feelings. So it was incredibly sad to read about Vance's father's secret battle with depression. His father had an emotionally rough life, but felt obligated to put on a happy face and keep his feelings to himself. He had a tough exterior and made fun of his son's sensitivity while keeping his own feelings bottled up inside. It's poignant that his father's inability to accept help push fans to finally seek the therapy that he needed. His perspective on therapy is refreshing. There's a great stigma around mental health and therapy in society in general, but it feels like especially so within the black community. Some people are encouraged to just endure, while others are simply told to pray, which is not enough for everyone. The story of feeling overwhelmed by life and grief and seeking therapy can be helpful to many people, especially the message of the importance of doing the work to improve and accept yourself so you can better communicate and interact and build relationships with others. It says a lot that Courtney was involved in a serious long-term live-in relationship with a woman that he 
wouldn't share his feelings with. Like he was with this woman for a decade, pretty much throughout his entire 20s and until about the age of 30. Yet, when he was lonely and wanted someone to talk to, he would call sex chat lines to speak with women who were strangers. The early influence of porn on his ability to communicate with women is interesting. It's like you get so used to having these one-sided fantasies that are all about you and your needs that you then find it difficult to communicate with and consider someone else's needs in an intimate relationship. It's Overindulgence in a fantasy world, which creates a mental block that prevents men, or in this case Vance, from developing truly intimate relationships with women in the real world. Courtney's relationship also shows the male perspective of holding on to a relationship because it feels comfortable rather than it being where you want to be. I think it's like, like sunk costs, where you've experienced so much with this person and invested heavily in the relationship that you're afraid to let go. Angela, to some degree, experiences this as well, where she has these fantasies in her youth about the type of man she wants to be with, but there's no real thought behind what kind of person he needs to be or his values. Instead, there's a greater focus on superficial features that result in her starting relationships with men that she really has no business dating. It seems to be a way of keeping yourself closed off and maintaining distance in relationships. And that goes for both for both of them. I love books like this that really give you an in-depth look at how successful projects or businesses come together. I actually enjoy watching videos and movies that show training regiments. I, I just admire the discipline and seeing it all come together. So reading about Bassett's preparation for roles was absolutely enthralling to me, especially because some of them were so physical. To get a detailed breakdown of how an actress embodies a character and decides where to add inflections or tone things down was interesting. It gave me an even deeper appreciation for not only Bassett's talent, but also her work ethic. It's like you can go back and watch these movies through new eyes. Media can give people a skewed view of celebrities that makes them feel as though they know these people personally. But it's actually a one-sided relationship where the celebrity likely has no idea that they exist. Thus, some people feel comfortable walking up to celebrities and like randomly touching them and doing other crazy stuff that you wouldn't do to most other people that like you just randomly see on the street. Not just a tap on the shoulder, but people grabbing and squeezing your arms or body. It says a lot that Someone can be violating your personal space and being inappropriate, but feeling uncomfortable telling them to stop because, you know, you don't want to seem rude or ungracious. So I know that happens with regular people, but I never thought of it with regards to dating celebrities, like expecting an actress to portray a character within a relationship. If that's what she does for a living, who would want to be stuck in character off the clock? Like, I would expect adults to be able to differentiate between the two. I like that both of them came to the realization that they wanted to improve as people and took time to explain their process. Not to say theirs is the one true way, but rather that this was what worked for them. It's interesting that they were both looking for validation and a sense of identity or completion in partners, but realized that they had to find that within themselves. Now, I was mostly agreeing with Bassett up to the point where she started discussing relationships, sex, and religion. When she ventured into soul ties and bleeding virgins, the thrill was gone. Bassett mentions having feelings of guilt around sex outside of marriage because of her religious upbringing. And I agree that some of those feelings probably come from having frivolous sex with men with whom she didn't really feel a connection. And I don't want to come across as being dismissive of her beliefs. That's not like my intention at all. But I also believe that it's probably more accurate that the issue she and other people feel with regards to sex is that religion and society teaches people that it's shameful. And also, you know, her personal history of the interactions that she had or the molestation that she experienced as a child. I don't take any issue with religion guiding your approach to sex and sexuality or deciding to save yourself for marriage or, you know, just because you want to or that you just aren't that interested in sex, it's fine. What I do take issue with is presenting ideas that are not fact-based as explanations for real life matters. The last thing we need is more false information floating around about sex and other biological matters. Virgins do not always bleed during intercourse and soul ties are not a real thing. 
They shouldn't be presented as facts and have no place in a logical discussion about sexuality. I did appreciate the message of not being complacent or settling in life, but rather striving to reach a place of being content with yourself, your achievements, and your life overall. Being grateful for what you have rather than lamenting what you don't have and allowing it to consume you. I think this is an incredibly important shift in perspective that could make a lot of people feel less stressed in life. Like this idea that, you know, you have to strive for things that you probably don't even value or you don't even think are important, but society tells you you should want and need and like your life is lacking if you don't have. Also, I respect that Bassett cares about how black people are portrayed in movies and takes that into account when considering roles. But I think it's limiting and unrealistic to only want to play good or wholesome characters or that all of your female characters have to demonstrate their love of black men. To be clear, I don't think we need more films focused on black men and women dogging each other or, you know, these negative stereotypes. But life and people are complex and some people aren't so great, but they have interesting stories. It's fine to have all of that and more in movies and characters. What we need is more diversity, balance, and complexity in the way black men and women are portrayed, not for the characters to only be soft and gentle with each other. And as a side note, I feel this compulsion that some black women feel to coddle and protect men who are undeserving of it to actually be emasculating or unnecessary. It's like saying that black men can't differentiate between good and bad characters, and their egos are so fragile that they need to be handled delicately in a way that other men and black women don't need. And also for like a woman to be doing it, like, or at least you shouldn't be jumping out in front of a man. Likewise, acting is acting. It's adult make-believe. I don't understand the idea that characters you play on film have to be a reflection of your real life or personal views. I'm not saying play roles that go against what you believe or that make you uncomfortable, but it's ridiculous to think, like for example with Courtney um, in The Preacher's Wife, it's ridiculous to feel like in order to play a preacher and stand in the pulpit, like you have to be baptized. Go ahead and get baptized if you want, and if you're at a place in your life where it's something you're called to do. But I really don't think anyone would be paying attention or would care that you're playing a preacher without being baptized. I mean, certainly no one expects you to go out and like murder a few people in order to play villain in a movie. Like it's unnecessary, right? You use your imagination. I don't want to give away the story of how the two end up together, but let me just say that it's very sweet. The back and forth between chapters ends and instead they share their perspectives on an event from within the same chapter. By this point in the book, they're both older and eventually get more into church. This is especially true for Vance. I'm not religious, but I don't mind hearing from people who are. I think inspiration and insight can come from different perspectives. But after a while, it began to feel a bit heavy-handed, especially Vance's perspective. He struck me as being a bit judgmental and self-righteous throughout the book, but it became even more apparent and a bit off-putting. I also side-eyed the constant message of aspiring to a traditional Christian marriage, but picking and choosing what that means. A big deal is made about the husband, in this case Vance, who is the one making the big deal really, being the head of the household, but then being more flexible about him not having to also be the primary breadwinner. It comes across to a degree as wanting to call the shots and be in control, without having to carry all of the burdens. Now to be clear, he doesn't sound like a dictator in the relationship, he's actually refreshingly supportive, but I just felt the constant rehashing of this head of household business was tiresome. Ultimately, everyone is free to make their own decisions and to decide for their own relationship how they want things to go, rather than following these generic rules and ideals. But that's why I always find it funny that people say these are the rules to follow and the way to do it and then break from tradition and pick and choose specifically what works for them. I thought this was a great book and enjoyed the behind the scenes look into the craft of acting and the business of theater, film, and television. As a longtime fan of Angela Bassett, I was a bit more biased towards learning about her career journey, but also enjoyed Courtney B. Vance's as well. The book was solid for me up to the point where they started discussing their wedding as, like honestly, I just hate wedding planning and I have no interest in it. And it just seemed to go on forever. And it was just, it was just tiresome for me. But it picked back up for me when they started discussing their journey to becoming parents, and I ultimately enjoyed the ending of the book. Given that the book has a male and female perspective, I think it could appeal to both genders. 
young adults and older adults might see bits and pieces of themselves or someone they know in the life story shared here. And I think it's an incredible book about figuring out how to better define what you want in a partner and more importantly, what you want within yourself. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please click the thumbs up button and share it online. I hope you'll also subscribe to the channel to get motivated, get inspired, and get more stories of Black history made and in the making. Until next time, take care.